Good morning, everybody. Welcome to MGBC. We're glad to have you with us today. Um, let's start the service off by singing. I don't know why we do anything else anyway. That's what we always do. But let's stand together. Thank you. You make me feel funnier than I am. <laughs> let's stand together. We're going to sing Jesus Paid It All.
Good morning. It's great to see you all. You kind of got in here a little bit on the slippery roads and uh, a little snow coming down outside. It's very beautiful. I want to take an opportunity this morning to introduce some new members to the Martinsburg Grace Brethren Church. So if those folks that are being recognized as new members would come on forward. And Larry, your wife will have to slide her way around here from the choir. And um, Brant, somewhere. There's Brant. Larry, come on up. And uh, we'll, we'll, we'll start actually with neither of you guys up here. Um, Gertrude Colbert sits back there. Gertrude has transferred her membership. You were a member here how many years ago? Do you remember? I put her on the spot. Okay. Long time ago she was a member. How many? About 50. About 50. A long time ago she was a member here, transferred her membership, went somewhere else, and now has transferred her membership back to Martinsburg Grace Brethren Church. That's Gertrude Colbert. We have Brant Lighty. Most of you know Brant. Uh, Brant was formerly on staff here at MGBC and uh, transferred his membership to another church where he was ministering and has now transferred it back to Martinsburg. We also have Larry and his wife, Amy Gallo. They, uh, Larry, if you remember, was baptized at the Family Fun Festival uh, this past summer, it was correct, time flies, yeah, this past summer, and so they have requested and have been granted membership here at Martinsburg Grace Brethren Church. The other person that uh, we don't have here today is Dave Helsel. 
Dave is on vacation, traveling Florida and due back anywhere from four to six, eight, ten weeks, sometime <laughs> around there, whenever, whenever the weather breaks. So when you see Dave, make sure that you, you welcome him. So what I want you to do is, following today's service, please make sure that you come up to these folks, welcome them, uh, let them know that you're very happy that they're part of the Martinsburg Grace Brethren Church family. So let's give them a round of applause. Thank you. Thank you very much. Welcome, everybody. Glad you're here. Glad you uh, braved the cold. When it's cold, it seems people are slower at getting up. So if they're not here in the next three minutes, they're going to have to walk around to those doors. So uh, I'm glad you decided to come here today. And if you are a visitor with us, just want to make you feel welcome. And there is a card in the pew rack in front of you. If you could fill that out. Drop it in the offering plate, and uh, we'd just like to, to get to know you a little bit better, and that will definitely help in the process. The district youth retreat is next weekend, so there will be a lot less teenagers, and I won't be here next week. We'll be over at Camp Manawagon for the district youth retreat, and I just got the final numbers in. We have over 150 coming to the retreat, and so if you're here, young people, and you didn't hit the deadline on Wednesday, I'm sorry, we're full, so... Uh, we're more than full, but with adults and, and everybody, we've got over 150 people going, so that's pretty awesome. So you can be praying about that. And also, next weekend, next Sunday at 4 o'clock over in the youth room, we'll have a family meeting. And so for those of you who might not know what that is or what that means, it's just an opportunity for us to get together and just talk about what, what's happening and what's going on. And if you were to have any questions, just sort of a, we do have some things we'd like to specifically talk about, but uh, it's also just an open forum for people to ask questions or, or just uh, sort of get a feel for where we're headed and uh, where we're at. Bob, why'd you go the whole way to the back again? I liked seeing you up front. You can sleep better back there, can't you? Okay. All right. Also, uh, February 2nd, after the ABF classes, we're going to have a youth fundraiser meal. Normally, we have a big uh, potluck meal downstairs where everybody brings things in and we share it and, uh, and then we come up for the meeting afterwards. Well, th we're going to do it a little bit different. The youth are going to do a fundraiser meal that Sunday right after the ABF class. So uh, you can come downstairs and enjoy that meal and, uh, and provide some, some gifts and donations to help get the kids to camp and youth conference. Also want to let you know that in the ABF classes this morning, there are sign-up sheets. What we're, we're trying to maximize the amount of money the kids can earn through these things, so we're asking for people to donate some things to cover, offset the cost of the meal. So if you would see in your class, there's a sign-up sheet in, the, in adult ABF classes that are asking for certain things. If you could help out with that, that would be, that would be great. Uh, and like I said earlier, the business meeting will be at, um, in here after that meeting, about 1.30, 1.15, 1.30 on February 2nd. And so all are welcome to attend, but whenever it comes down to the vote on the budget, uh, that is a members only vote. And uh, February 8th, the All Church Skate, Pie, and Ice Cream Social is at 6 p.m. up at the park. So if you are here today and you are a good or prolific baker, as I know some of you are, uh, you could sign up during your classes. There's a lot of sign-ups in ABF classes today, so uh, make sure you, you look through all of them. But one of them is for this event that you can bring pies or cakes along to share. And uh, also at the information table. I also real quickly want to say tomorrow is a very important day in our nation's history as we celebrate the birth of Bob Russell. And, uh, uh, he, guys, he's shy. He's shy. You know him. He's shy. He cut him some slack here. He doesn't like attention drawn to himself. Uh, happy birthday, Pastor Rahul. How old are you now? 55? Is it 55? Yeah. North of 55, right? That's all we'll say. Now, I believe it's 76, right? Okay. Now, if you were a woman, I wouldn't have said that number out loud, but men don't seem to care as much. So, happy birthday, Pastor Bob. And, uh, and we're glad that you're here today. I just, uh, as we go into our time of prayer, I just want to give an update. Tomorrow is something that our international missions 
uh, arm of the fellowship, Encompass World Partners, is trying to get people together, rallied together, and they're calling it a day of solidarity. And what they're asking for is for all of us to band together in prayer for the Central African Republic. And if you're not sure or haven't heard what's going on over there, it is a, a war-torn area right now. Uh, there are over one million people displaced in the, in the city of Bangui, which is where most of the, the hub of, the, of, of our ministry happens in Bangui, and 60% of the citizens in Bangui are in refugee camps. We've lost at least one Grace Brethren Church building to fire, uh, and so there's just a lot of turmoil, things that, that we can't even really fathom here. So what we're asking is that tomorrow is a day that, that we band together in prayer, and uh, you are intentional in your prayers for the CAR, not just for the Grace Brethren work that's happening there, but for all people. And what they're asking for is two specific prayer requests that you just take to the Lord as often as possible tomorrow. And, uh, and that is pray for peace for the country, for this to, to, be, uh, for this to be calmed uh, very quickly. And they also have over one million pounds of food that they're waiting for an inn to the country to get it distributed. So if you could pray for an in for them to be able to distribute that aid, that would be, uh, that would be great. We're just going to ask the Lord to do a mighty work there. And so if we could band together and pray for them. I'm not just saying you can only pray for them tomorrow, but the fellowship is asking that we're intentional with that tomorrow. So if you could uh, do that, that would, be, that would be great. And we're going to pray for them this morning as we collect our offering. God, we thank you for what you're doing in hearts and lives all over the world. We're thankful for the many thousands and, and, uh, and millions that have been saved in the CAR through the missions work that's happened there over the years. And Lord, it's just a, it's a mess right now. And so we ask that you would intervene. We ask that you would provide peace to a country that desperately needs it right now. And we ask that you would provide a the means to be able to provide this food to the citizens in the CAR. Lord, I pray that you would move quickly and swiftly and provide aid and help where it is needed most. Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit takes charge and that those who, uh, who are fighting each other would see that, uh, that the end result is not, uh, is not really what they're looking for in the beginning anyway. Lord, I just pray that, again you would provide peace. Lord, thank you that we live in a place where this is uncommon. We live in a place where this is not something that we experience. Lord, we're thankful for that, but we also don't want to become ignorant to the fact that it happens all over the world. So, Lord, may you take what you have abundantly blessed us with this morning. Use it to further your kingdom, not just here, but all over the world. In your name I pray. Amen. Your grace is enough. 
Because he lives, we can face tomorrow. Because he lives, you hold the future, God. Because he lives, you have saved us from our sin. You have filled the hole, Father, the void between us and you because of our sin. Now, Lord, as we look into your word, I pray that your spirit will speak, will move powerfully. Use my feeble thoughts, my feeble words, Lord. Magnify them within the hearts and the souls of your church. We ask this in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Children, you are dismissed. I think Adam said it was John Piper, 12 years in Romans. Is that what you said? 13 years. John Piper spent 13 years covering the book of Romans as he preached through it in his church. We're covering the entire Bible in four weeks. I'm not sure which is more strange, but uh, we're giving it a shot. We're going to proceed forward and we're going to move on. It's a great challenge. The main focus of these four sermons is this that Jesus Christ is the main character of the Bible. The central point, the central figure of the Scripture is Jesus Christ. So just to catch you up to speed, in case you missed Adam's two sermons, I'm just going to go a little flyby here, just give you a little quick summary as to where he was, what he talked about, just to bring you up to the place of Scripture that we are today. He started out by talking about the Bible, and he made the statement that the Bible is not an antiquated book. It's not like that old first aid kit. Remember, he brought that old first aid kit, had all the things in it? The Bible is not like that. It's real, it's relevant, and it's true, just as much as it was then as it is today. That medical kit had things in it that certainly should have been thrown out, that were unusable, information that was outdated. The Bible is not like that. We said, or Adam said, that Jesus Christ is the central character. The central focal point of the Word of God is Jesus Christ. And you say, well, you don't see Jesus until three quarters of the way through the book. That's not the case. Make sure that you stay tuned. We'll get back to that in a moment. In Genesis 1, we see that God existed. God spoke. God created. In Genesis 2, by the way, you see a second creation account. A little bit different than the one in Genesis 1. And if you are wondering why they're different, commercial message, you can stop in at my ABF class this morning after service, and we're going to discover, we're going to learn why those two are different. Man is created, he is given a free will, because for him to love God without a free will, it would be automatic, it would be robotic-like. And so God gives him a free will. In Genesis 3, man takes that free will and uses it to go counter to God's plan, to go counter to God's way. There's now a hole in the relationship. Adam indicated that there's a vast chasm, a hole between God and between man because of his sin. 
But in verse 15 of Genesis chapter 3, we read this. You don't have to turn there. God is in the process of pronouncing the curse upon Satan, and here's what he says. I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He, Jesus, shall crush your head, and you, Satan, shall strike his heel. A plan is already in motion. A plan has already begun. We're moving forward. Then we have the presentation of the law. The law, Adam said, was like a mirror. It was there for the people to look into and to see their sin, to see how they were to relate to one another and to God, but it did nothing for the curse of sin. It didn't correct the problem. It merely demonstrated and got them to see what the problem was. God would send prophets, multiple prophets, people, trying to explain the law to them and tell them that that law pointed them back to God. As the prophets would come, the people didn't want to hear it. They didn't want to hear what God had to say about the prophets, so oftentimes they would abuse them and sometimes even execute them and kill them. God would get tired of this rejection, this continual repeated rejection over and over and over. He got sick of it, and he would tell the people, listen, don't intermarry with the other races around you. We want to keep you pure for my purposes, but they would, they would intermarry, and then that would bring in their false gods, and then idolatry began to spring up and grow. And God would punish them by putting them into captivity. Five foreign nations, five foreign nations would subject the people of Israel over 600 years prior to Jesus Christ. Each time, God would put them into subjection to these people because of their ways, because of their, their ignorance to following Him, because of their denial of listening and obeying what God had told them to do. Well, this was a great source of hardship on the people, being in bondage repeatedly over those many years. God's plan from the beginning, Genesis 3, is still moving forward. It's still progressing. God's plan is set forth. He's waiting for the right time, the right situation, the right circumstance, the right people, the right sacrifice. The world is being prepared for God to spring his final act of the plan into action. Everything has to be just right. Everything has to fit his plan and be ready. Everything has to be just exactly the way God wants it to be. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 1. Verse 1. That's on page 523, if you're using the Pew Bible in front of you, those little blue ones. Now, I don't know what your Bible looks like, but mine looks like this. Matthew 1.1 1, 1 is right here, and to the left is a blank page. Most of you have a blank page there somewhere just prior to that. If you want to think about it this way, think about it like this. That blank page represents 400 years in which God is silent. 400 years, no communication with His people, no prophets, no speaking from God, no law, no demonstration, just God is silent. So that page right there represents 400 years of silence. Now, I will tell you this, that although God is silent during those 400 years, it does not mean that His plan is not moving forward. There are many things that are happening within the Jewish people, within their religion, as well as within the culture and the world at that time that make it the perfect time for God's plan to come into complete fulfillment. Here's what we see with the Jewish religion. Because the people were taken into bondage, they were spread out all throughout the land. Remember now, the temple is the primary source of their faith, of their religion. It's the focal point. And now they're dispersed all throughout the land. They're, they're all over the place. They can't get back to the temple. And so what happens is, they begin to spring up little places of worship called synagogues. They don't know exactly how to worship in those synagogues, so they go to what they know. They go to the law. The law is the primary focal point in the synagogue. But who's going to teach us the law? Well, a group called the Pharisees rise to power. 
a group that had good intentions at the beginning. They said, listen, we're dispersed. What we need to do is we need to get back to our roots. We need to get back to the law. We can show you what the law is. We can bring you back to God. But in a very short period of time, what the Pharisees did was they created various traditions. They developed their own interpretations of what the law was. They placed restrictions upon the people. They would place additional requirements over and above the law, which moved the people from its original purpose to point them back to God and more towards the Pharisees and their obligations and what they needed to do. Their intentions were good, but God was in the process of being pushed aside. Also in that 400 years, you see some amazing social and cultural things in which, remember now, God is preparing the world and the people for just the perfect time. The world as they knew it was unified under a common language, Greek. Imagine how effective that would be for communication, both written as well as oral. The world was unified under one language, Greek. There was an incredible period of peace in which ideas could flourish and people could interact. There was very, very seldom any war during that 400-year period. The Romans were in charge and they had instituted the Pax Romana, the Roman peace. Transportation system advanced. There were roads that were built so that people could travel from one location to the other very quickly and very effectively. Obviously not like we have today, but for that period of time, it was amazing how quickly they could move from one location to the other. They could actually send a letter 50 to 75 miles to one location in one day. They had a mailing system set up that they could move letters that quickly, move printed material that quickly. Now imagine how that's going to come into play when people like Paul begin to write and start sending his letters around to the various churches. God is working. It's quiet. Then all of a sudden, a man comes on the scene by the name of John the Baptist. He literally comes out of the woods. Literally. Comes out of the woods. Here's this guy. Doesn't look like anybody special. Camel hair all over him. A true woodsman. All right, you talk about Duck Dynasty. That's the original Duck Dynasty right there. All right? Comes out of the woods, and what does he do? Well, he proclaims Jesus Christ. He pro proclaims that the Messiah is coming. He has an announcement. You see, what would happen in those days is when a king would come to a town or a village, a day or so before, a herald would come beforehand and say, Hey, hey, Martinsburg, the king is coming here. He's going to be here on Tuesday. All right? And so all the people in the town, the borough manager, Randy, and everybody, we'd all be running around and spiff up the town because the king is coming, right? The king is coming. And so John the Baptist does the same thing. He's announcing that the king is coming. The king is on his way. The Messiah, Jesus Christ, is on his way. John's message is very important. He's a humble servant. He steps aside as the people start to draw to him. He says, no, 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 don't look at me. Look at the Messiah. Look at Jesus. Don't look at me. Look at him. I must become less. He must become greater. He also had a message of repentance. And he did something very interesting. He did something called baptism for the repentance of sins. Now, the Jews understood that we had, they had an idea of baptism. It was called ceremonial cleansing. They would wash before they went into the temple, but all they were doing it for was the ritualistic nature. They would wash so they could pass by the Pharisees and the religious leaders to go into the temple. They were only doing it because that's what they were expected to do. John says, no, he says, I'm going to baptize you for the repentance of sin. It now became a matter of their soul. It was now becoming a matter of their heart, and he moved them back to that through this idea of baptism. John would proclaim that Jesus, the Messiah, was on his way. He would figuratively and physically point to Jesus, the Messiah. So Jesus comes on the scene. Here he is. He's born of a peasant girl, a virgin, in the midst of a scandal in which people thought all around that she wasn't quite as pure as everybody thought she was. And she's pregnant. She has this child. Not much is known about Jesus after the birth of of the Christ. We don't know much about his childhood. Um, his parents obviously lost him for a few days. We read about that. They travel for a feast and they leave the city thinking somebody else has Jesus. No, they have Jesus. No, they have Jesus. And where is he? 
He's back in town in the temple with the religious leaders, already surrounding himself and learning and surrounding himself with people. So Jesus begins his ministry. He grows. He institutes his ministry. He has to have the right people around him. So he starts to gather disciples. He starts to bring men around him to be his disciples. See, Jesus, knowing that he was going to die, would have to have someone that could transmit that story, that could teach the people after him about who he was and what he did. So he starts to gather these disciples around him. He has to have reliable men. He has to have men that he can teach. He has to have men that will hear him and listen to him and obey him. This would require some training. This would require some modeling. This would be difficult. These men would frustrate him. They would fail him. They would misunderstand him. They would deny him. They would abandon him. Yet these are the men that he chooses to surround himself with. These are the men that he entrusts. These 12 he entrusts to take his teaching and his message that he is the Son of God to the world. These 12 men. He calls them apostles. They're messengers, sent ones. They're going to be sent to teach Jesus Christ and the gospel to the world. They're quite a mixed bag, by the way, if you ever studied them. They're very interesting. Uh, you have a zealot who's a military rebel, a fighter, basically, a, a, a militia man. You have one who is a tax collector, obviously despised and hated by the people. Two brothers with anger issues, all right, both from a wealthy fishing family. You have one who was married, denied that he would know Jesus, was brash and spontaneous, and he would be the one that would turn out to be God's chosen to lead the church. It would be upon him and upon his message that he would take that would institute the church. Another had a chronic problem with doubt and security, and one would be placed in charge of the treasury. He would be given the giftedness of taking care of the money. He would also be the one that would lie, cheat, and basically turn Christ over to the Roman authorities and betray him. It was the right time. The world has been prepared. John the Baptist has called the world's attention to the Messiah, to Jesus Christ. The disciples have been collected. We have the right man. We have the right leader. We have the right announcement. We have the right teacher. Now we need the right sacrifice. Everything is now in place for the whole to be filled. The gap in the relationship between us and God is about to be filled. It will be filled by the great news of Jesus Christ that he came, that he lived, he taught, he died, he was buried, and he rose again. The Bible and its primary character are headed towards the climax. We are about to reach the pinnacle of the story. Turn with me to Galatians chapter 4. In the Pew Bible, it's 632. Everything has been pointing towards the Messiah, the chosen one. You say, well, we haven't seen much of Jesus throughout the Old Testament. Hang on. Hang on. Page 632 in the Pew Bible. Galatians 4, starting in verse 4. Galatians 4, 4. But when the time had fully come, God sent His Son, born of a woman, born under law, to redeem those under law, that we might receive the full rights of His Son. That we might receive the full rights of His sons. Notice it again. We might receive the full rights of His sons, that we could become sons and daughters. Notice, God sent. He didn't create Him. He always existed. He always was. God sent him, the eternal Christ, his son, he sent him. Born of a woman, he was fully man. It also says that he was born under the law, which indicates that he was a Jew. To redeem, what's his purpose? To redeem those under law, that we might receive the full rights to be sons and daughters of God. He came to fill the hole to fill the void in the relationship. Jesus, as I said, is the central character of the Bible. When you read the Scripture, you have to read with that mindset 
that Jesus is the central figure. Now, you've said, well, if he, if he wasn't there for three quarters of the Bible. We don't see Jesus. No, we saw him in chapter 3. Remember, he's the one that will crush Satan's head. Yes, his heel will be struck through death, burial, and resurrection. Three days, Satan will feel like he's victorious, but when Christ is risen from the dead, he will crush Satan's head. We see him in Genesis 22. We see him there. Abraham takes his son Isaac up on top of a mountain, the same mountain in which Jesus is teaching at the temple, the same mountain that is just a stone's throw from Golgotha. Right there, Jesus is symbolically represented in Isaac. Isaac puts the wood on his back, just as Christ would put the wood on his back, travels up the mountain and prepares himself to be sacrificed. His father is going to sacrifice him there. Abraham's son, his one son, his only son. Jesus is represented there in Genesis 22. We see him also in Exodus 12, the Passover lamb. Place the blood on the doorposts of the perfect lamb, and the death angel will pass over, pointing to Jesus Christ. We see him there. We see him in the story of Jonah and the whale. How many days was Jonah in the belly of the whale? Three. Jesus even represents that. Jesus even speaks to that and points back to that in his own teaching. We see Jesus there again in Jonah and his story. It turned to John chapter 10. It's on page 583. John chapter 10, verse 14. Jesus has been presented all through the scriptures. His teaching. Here's one of the aspects of his teaching here that John records in chapter 10, starting in verse 14. I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep, and my sheep know me. Just as the Father knows me, I know the Father. Jesus' is teaching of his divinity there, his relationship with the Father. He is one with the Father. Continuing on, and I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep pen of, that are not of this sheep pen. I must bring them also. They too will listen to my voice, and there shall be one flock and one shepherd. The reason my Father loves me is that I lay down my life only to take it back up again. The Jews didn't crucify and kill Jesus. The Romans didn't kill him. He lays down his life. He gave it up. But he also has the power to take it back up again. We see the life of Jesus. We see his death. We see his burial. We see his resurrection. End of the story, right? I mean, the Bible has been pointing to that all throughout history. We see it all through the Old Testament. We get to the New Testament, we get to the Gospels, there it is. There's his life, his teaching, there's his death, his burial, resurrection, end of story. I mean, what purpose does all that have to Martinsburg here 2,000 years later? What's the significance of that event to you and I today? Here's the key. The work of Christ gave you and I something very important. It's called the Gospel. The gospel. It means good news. Now, for some of you, this is something that you've heard before, okay? But for some of you, this may be the first time that you've heard this. Please understand, the first four books of the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, are called gospels. That's not the gospel. It contains it. But if someone were to ask you, what is the gospel? Don't respond by saying Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Those are books of the Bible. They weren't even categorized at what we call term gospels until two, three hundred years after Christ. You say you believe in Jesus Christ, you better know the gospel. You say that you are a follower of Jesus Christ, you better know the gospel. You say that you want to witness for Jesus Christ, you want to talk to your neighbors, the people you work for, you better know Jesus Christ. You better know the gospel. You see, you can't separate Christ from the gospel. You, you, you can't do that. They're intimately connected together. This uh, past week, um, not this past week, the week before, we went to district ministerium down at uh, Community Church in Everett. 
And then there were several pastors there. I don't know, we had 15, 18 or so. We were sitting around. We were talking about some of the issues. And one of the things that popped up was this. That to a man around that circle, many of them said, one, to their own discredit, and, to, and ours also, that the church today has gotten away to some extent from teaching and preaching the gospel. And we recognize that. We also understand that we have been deficient in teaching you all what the gospel is. Or maybe what we do is we assume that people know what the gospel is. So do you know what the gospel is? Do you? If I were to hand out a paper right now and there was only one question on it, define if you would, write down a definition as to what the gospel is. Write it down. Could you do it? I'm not going to ask you to do that, by the way. But could you do it? Do you fully understand what the gospel is and its power? This is important, you see, because when you separate Jesus from the gospel, the church starts to lose its power. When you, as followers of Jesus Christ, begin to separate Jesus from the gospel, you don't have the same power through the Spirit that you once had. You see, when we separate the gospel from Jesus Christ... He starts to slide into just being another great teacher. He starts to slide into the idea of, you've heard it, well, he was a good man and a great prophet, but he really wasn't the son of God. When you start to separate Jesus from the gospel, it's a slippery slope. It's a slippery slope. Turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 624 in the Pew Bible. Paul's writing to the church at Corinth. This is Paul's writing here. 1 Corinthians 15, the first six verses. Again, 624 in the Pew Bible. Now, brothers, I want want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel you are saved, if you hold firmly to the word I preach to you, otherwise you have believed in vain. For what I received I passed on to you as of first importance that Christ died for our sins according to the Scripture, that He was buried, that He was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures, and that He appeared to Peter and then to the twelve. After that, He appeared to more than 500 of the other brothers at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Go back to verse 1. Paul says, I took this gospel and I preached it to you. I taught you this gospel. I have shared this gospel with you. You have taken your stand upon it, it says. That is its truth, and this church has taken its stand upon it. The gospel is this, that you can be saved through this gospel. Paul preached it to them. He preached the gospel and he made sure that they understood that they could be saved through this and only through this. Paul passed it on as a matter of priority. Notice it says of first importance, that was his primary focus. That's what he taught, the gospel. That's what he preached, the gospel. It was of first importance. But what is it? What is the gospel? Well, there's a definition for you right there. Here's the gospel. That Christ died for a specific purpose, your sin and my sin, according to the Scriptures. I read that a little differently in my mind, that Christ died for my sin because it was part of the plan. It says according to the Scripture, but as we've said, it was the plan all the way through, from Genesis 3.15, all the way through. He died according to the Scriptures. He died as a part of the plan. He was buried. He was raised on the third day, again, all according to plan, according to the Scripture. In Romans 1.16, you don't have to turn there, it says this, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Flip back a couple pages there in 1 Corinthians, back to chapter 1. Just a few pages. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Starting in verse 17. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, 
not with words of human wisdom, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are believing, who us who are being saved, it is the power of God. There's an interesting word used there twice. It's called power. It's the word dynamis, the word from which we get the concept or the idea, terminology, as of dynamite. You see, the gospel is power. That's the key to it. What Christ did ingrains power within us as followers of Jesus Christ. Power, though, to do what? Power that we can tap into. But, but what's the purpose of it today? John Piper, in his book, The Passion of Jesus Christ, provides us with 50 reasons why Jesus suffered and died. I'm not going to go through all 50. But Jesus' death and resurrection does several things. Here's where the power comes in. The power, the power is to transform lives. The power that Paul's talking about there is to transform lives, to change people. Jesus' death and resurrection frees us from guilt. You know, there are probably some of us here in this auditorium right now that are dealing with all sorts of aspects of guilt, bad decisions that were made, broken relationships, things which were said, things which were done, all of that weighing heavy upon us to the point where guilt is just pouring in on us that we feel like we're worthless, that we can't make it, that how could a God possibly love someone that has done the things that I've done? I don't know what's in your past. But Jesus is telling you the power of the gospel, his death, burial, and resurrection says, you don't have to worry about that guilt anymore. You don't have to take that on anymore. He's taking it on for you. He took it on the cross. The death, burial, and resurrection of Christ gives us purpose and meaning in our lives. Remember what we read in John 10. He laid down his life. He gave his life for you. Your life has meaning. Your life has purpose. You're created in the very image of God. That's part of the power of the gospel. Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection removes our fear of death. Should the Lord tarry, we're all going to die. We're all going to pass. Christ's death, burial, and resurrection defeated death. We don't have to fear that anymore. That's the power of the gospel. He provided a demonstration of ultimate forgiveness. Christ is hanging on the cross taking the sins of the world, and he says, Father, forgive them, all of us, for they do not know what they are doing. What an example. What a demonstration. If he can forgive us for all the things that we have done, can we not restore relationships with those in our family, in our community, those that are around us? Can we not extend forgiveness to them? That's the power of the gospel. Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection frees us from the law. You say, well, we don't have a problem with the law today, Brian. That was for the Jews back then. Remember you said the Pharisees and kept pointing them to the law and, and they got away from God. We do have a problem with the law today. Probably some of you in this room are here this morning for one reason only, because it's the right thing to do. You're here just simply because church is where you go on Sunday mornings. You sing in the choir. You teach Sunday school. You take care of the nursery. All very, very important things. But if you're doing those things for the wrong reason, you're just following the law. If you're doing those things because it's the right thing to do, you're following the law. We do have a problem with the law today. Many people feel that getting to heaven and salvation is about your good deeds outweighing your bad ones. If I had a dollar for every time someone at the federal prison where I used to work told me that, hey, how do you get into heaven? Well, you just do more good things than you do bad things. We could put new carpet in the sanctuary, something like that, with all that money. Your good deeds merely have to outweigh the bad things. Well, when you dig down to the core people, there really is no such thing as a good deed. Because chances are, the deeds that we're doing that we call good are motivated out of our own pride, are motivated out of our own desire to impress someone else to gain an advantage, perhaps, maybe not. But oftentimes, our good deeds are focused upon that. They're not really focused upon service to God and being out of the love for Him 
they're really kind of focused on our own agenda. They're done for show, for pride, for ulterior motives. Here's the big problem, though. You see, if you can get to heaven because the good deeds outweigh the bad deeds, you have no need for Christ's death. If your good deeds can outweigh the bad deeds, and that's how you get in, then there's no reason for Christ to die. He could just sit there, put all the good things on this side, all the bad things on this side, weigh it out, and then pronounce judgment. Oh, too many bad things, you go down. Oh, a lot of good things, good, outweigh, you go up. There would be no need for Christ's death. There would be no need for his burial, for his resurrection, if the good deeds could outweigh the bad. Piper says this, God's way of saving people is not about keeping records of good performance or bad conduct. God's method of saving people is not about keeping records of good performance and bad conduct. God is about wiping out the record completely. He's not interested in how many good things and bad things. He's interested in the gospel, his son dying for us and wiping out the record completely. Casting our sins as far from us as the east is from the west. That's what he's about. It's not about the scale and more on this side than on this side. So let me just kind of summarize here. The gospel. What is it? What does it mean? What is it all about? Well, man created a sin. We had a free will choice. Man created. He he sinned. And he created this hole, this gap between us and God. God responds out of grace. That is, he's not forced to. He doesn't have to. He's not driven to. He merely does it out of love. He responds out of grace and sets a plan in motion. He sets a plan in motion at the beginning of creation in order to pursue us and to get us back. God in his love and grace through no effort on our own provided a plan to fill the hole. The law helped point us to God but we got away from it. The law helped to show us God, but it didn't have all that it needed. It could show us the sin, but it couldn't do anything to repair it. The whole world tells us you can fill the hole between you and God with a lot of other things. If you just have enough power, bigger house, enough money, enough fame, enough attention, the right relationship, have the right people around you, All that will fill the hole. That void that you feel, it can be filled with all of those things. That's not what fills the hole. Jesus Christ, the gospel, his death, burial, resurrection, based upon his grace, out of nothing that we have done, that's what fills the hole. Jesus came and gave up his life for us so that the hole could be filled. He laid down his life and he took it back up again. It was part of the plan. It's the theme of Scripture. The character is Jesus Christ, but the theme of all of the Bible, the gospel. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. We, uh, we, we, Father, don't deserve what you have done. It is through your grace and through your mercy. You initiated and instituted a plan And that plan worked, and at the right time, when the world was prepared, on your timetable, you sent your son. He came to this earth. He lived. He was crucified. He gave his life. He laid it down for our our sin on behalf of us. Again, not out of anything that we have done, Father, but because of your grace. Father, we just pray that this day, There may be some sitting here right now that just have not experienced that grace, have not experienced that gospel, have not experienced that power, the power to transform lives. We pray, Father, that they would feel your spirit. Move them, Lord. We thank you for your word. We thank you for your spirit. We thank you for the gospel that was given to us through your son, Jesus Christ. In thy name we pray. Um, As we sing this next song, It's a new one to the congregation, not necessarily a new song. You may have heard it before. Um, But I want us to keep in mind that as we sing any of these songs, uh, we're not just singing to Jesus who I accepted into my heart when I was five years old, which did happen. Um, But we're, we're also proclaiming the name of the Messiah.
that was prophesied as early as Genesis 3, as Brian shared. Um, so the name of this song is Jesus Messiah. It, it says that exact word. Um, the, he, he was the coming king, and he is our king forever now, um, which is just an awesome thing. So let's stand together as we learn this song together and, and praise his name. Jesus Messiah, name above all names, blessed Redeemer, Emmanuel, the rescue for sinners, the ransom for
that chorus one more time. Jesus Messiah, name above all names, blessed Redeemer, Emmanuel, the rescue for sin. The plan was put in place. At the right time, the right people, the right sacrifice was all offered up for you. It is the gospel. That gospel has power. Power to transform lives. Power to forgive you from the sins of the past. Power to mend relationships. Power to free you from the law. It's here. It's given by grace. It's a free gift. Christ came. He gave his life. He laid it down for you and for me, the power of the gospel. Father God, we thank you and praise you. We are so unworthy, yet you, Lord, sent your Son, gave his life for us. And now as we go, Father, we come back next week, we're going to consider now our responsibility of what to do with that gospel. That's to take it out, to share it, to teach others, to turn their eyes towards Jesus Christ. I thank you for each one here. I pray a blessing upon their family. In thy name we pray. Amen. Thank you. You're dismissed.